Hello and welcome back to Best of the Day from the 2013 meeting of the American Society of Hematology. I'm talking with Dr. Myron Chuchman this evening about the lymphoma data from this year's meeting. So, Chuch, let's let's move on. We've talked about abrutinib and uh, idelalisib. Um, the other agent and that I know that you've been involved sure. uh, with a lot is lenalidomide. Yeah. Well approved and used in multiple myeloma, but it has significant activity in lymphomas, and now it's being combined with rituxan in, in what uh, people are calling R squared. Right. So, um, so there was a, there was a presentation um, I think from the Carnell Group, uh, looking at the combination of rituximab and lenalidomide uh, in uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and using it as frontline therapy. Um, avoiding some of the hopefully tremendous adverse event profiles of hyper CVAD and, and um, those suggest that EPOC R and things of this sort. So tell us about uh, this regimen and uh, what sort of activity they saw. I think it's interesting, Jim. We, we've discussed in the past and we know there is data and it originated um, from MD Anderson, a friend, my friend Nathan Fowler, that looked at R squared with respect to um, follicular lymphoma and lindal lymphoma, but amazing results in follicular lymphoma. And that study is a thousand patient study being randomized between, say, the R squared versus um, R chemo. And with respect to that, those patients then have a maintenance phase built in, but about yeah. 500 out of 1,000 patients in this global study has actually been accrued. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see. So, yeah. But does it work in other types of uh, lymphoma? So this was an extension looking at, say, well, how does it work? with respect to patients with mantle cell lymphoma. And you're correct, there really is not a standardized type of approach, but I'll be honest with you, based on the recent, at least in the last few years, and things that have been done in large trials, including the Nordic trials, is that the real changes were made when we added rituximab to the treatment of mantle mm -hmm. cell lymphoma, also high-dose cytarabine. And a lot of us still believe that if you have a healthy young patient, that we should be looking at uh, autologous stem cell transplantation of first CR. But things are going to get shaken up and going to be changing maybe based on novel data. And the real question is we need to look at trials actually comparing high-dose therapy with some of these novel agents right. and seeing whether or not we're going to be able to get rid of maybe the more toxic, aggressive and interventions. And anthracyclines and alkylating agents yep. and uh, topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. Absolutely. And well, well, this was interesting. This was 31 patients. They had previously, as you mentioned, untreated mantle cell lymphoma. Of also interest, they were equally distributed with respect to the MIPI, the Mantle Cell mm -hmm. International Prognostic Index. So these were not cherry-picked patients. They were all doing great. And with respect to treatment, these patients received, they started at 20 milligrams of lilidomide with day 1 through 21 out of 28-day cycles. And they're supposed to get 12 cycles. Mm -hmm. With respect to rituximab, it was getting a little differently. They, they boosted up the amount of rituxan from the beginning. So you got weekly times four with the first month. Right. Then after they got one cycle, one dose every two months. So basically a total of nine doses for the first year. Now, if you were responding and doing well, there was, that was your induction phase. There was a maintenance phase built in. And at that point, the, the dose of lenalidomide was dropped down to 15 milligrams. And patients were getting then, then get rituximab every other treatment. And mm -hmm. in this trial... Patients would continue therapy until they developed either progressive disease or they couldn't tolerate therapy. Right. Maybe a little bit concerning, there's a trend here that in a number of trials, and I don't say that there's anything wrong with doing these initial trials, but I am a little concerned that the general trend is that we are continuing therapies that are novel until patients progress. And it may not be that they're going to have cross resistance, but my only concern, and I think we have to be wary, is whether or not when they progress, how will they respond to additional treatments? And I think that will answer those questions and always can adapt from the responses that we see yeah. in the therapy. But this was quite impressive. The overall response rate without a standard chemotherapeutic drug, a mixed in there of 77% with a 40% complete remission rate. And some of these patients are continuing therapy. We'll see if we actually improve that further. The median time to response, again, 2.8 months. Uh, Pretty quick. Amazing. And right now, the progression-free survival hasn't been reached, but the patients have only been monitored for a year right now. Right. But, you know, it is something that we didn't even dream about five right. or ten years ago, that some of these novel targeted agents could have this type of activity. Well, it would be really interesting to see 
how durable these yeah. CR responses are. I mean, right. if they if they go on for several years, you know, or and even that, longer. That's an excellent that's point, Jim. I think great. that's the other point that some of these targeted agents. Now, remember, we started out the worst of the worst. A lot of the patients that we were treating were very resistant, refractory, especially with the you know the the B cell receptor inhibitor. The only issue of concern would be that sometimes when you actually stop the treatment, some of these patients actually relapse fairly quickly. But right. there were indications in colleagues when we discussed the different trials, there are some patients that will have long, prolonged remission durations of maybe two years or more. So I guess it'll just be interesting because these are yeah. previously untreated patients where they have a different type right. of response. And, and many of Many of these agents, especially yeah. the ones we've, we've talked about, abrutinib and idelalus, yes. they just have not been used that long. And True. so we really don't know yet just how durable all these responses are going to be and, and how well patients are going to do. Exactly. So the French have also yeah. done an R-squared sort of program, but they've added the lenalidomide to yeah. R-CHOP. So it's like R-squared CHOP. Right. Um, so is, is this tolerable, and uh, does this significantly uh, improve the response rates to our chop? I think that's actually very interesting. We've heard and we've actually discussed, I think last year, the R-squared chop in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that lelalidomide appears, yes, it can be added to standard r 21 Vast majority of patients can tolerate it. Um, it, it was interesting. It's, I believe it was 25 milligrams for 10 days. The Mayo Clinic did it a little different than the Europeans. And then I think the other group were using 15 milligrams for 14 days. So a little different dosing, but the same uh, mm -hmm. idea. Yes, it can be incorporated, and they see responses. The only other thing that's strange, uh, it's somewhat strange or unusual, is that we know that rituxan doesn't work in the large cell lymphoma post-therapy. But of interest, uh, there was some uh, preliminary data showing that patients, after they completed therapy, if they got additional rituxan with high-risk disease, might actually have an improvement outcomes. Now, this was interesting because it's R squared CHOP in uh, patients, upfront patients with very high tumor burden follicular lymphoma. And I think that's interesting. We've got uh, we've re we've gotten very comfortable. Many right. individuals, not only in academics but in the community, that beta muscular you hear follicular lymphoma, you think beta muscular rituxan upfront. Right. But I think that the time is coming, and we've maybe mentioned this before for individualized or personalized medicine based on perhaps not just biomarkers, but the clinical, the way that patients present prognostically. Right. We know that high tumor burden patients, although can respond to beta muscular rituxan, this actually, this data is actually very interesting. They had 80 patients, multi-institutional. They found an overall response rate of 94%, and uh, three quarters of the patients, 75% essentially, had complete remissions. And I think that's quite high. And then what they described is 25% of the patients had masses greater than 10 centimeters, over 50% had bone marrow involvement, 40% had elevated LDH that we don't commonly see in the typical, let's say, vanilla flavored right. follicular lymphoma, and 63% of those patients had a high risk flippy. So it's interesting that you know, our CHOP group. is not dead. Yeah. And our CHOP for patients, especially, we should remind people that in follicular lymphoma, especially 3B, should be treated with an anthracycline-based therapy. Right. But in this situation, these are grade 1, 2, 3A. If you have a high tumor burden, at least to consider the possibility in young or younger or healthier patients that maybe this is important. Now, they had five episodes of thrombosis, and we know that that's one of the potential toxicities that's of lenalidomide. But they did prophylax, but oral aspirin, just 100 milligrams a day, might Which to me enough. seems a little bit low. I mean, I typically, when I have lymphoma patients on a number of trials with lenalidomide, I actually, I mean, it, there's no science here. I use a 325 milligram. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, I mean, I think that maybe that would have been a little low. They also had three cases, which was not a, a necessary thing of concern, that three of these patients, a number of these being elderly patients, did get neoplasm, other cases of neoplasm during follow-up. Now, we know that these patients are at risk for other malignancies and neoplasms. I just mentioned that that was included in the abstract, but this is being looked at very carefully. And unlike just in the French, where they looked at the myeloma patients post-transplant, heavy, heavy treatment with alkylating agents, that signal doesn't appear to be coming up and being, being evaluated and scrutinized very carefully by Celgene and by many investigators. We're not seeing that in other types of histologies. So you, yeah. you've done a lot of work with lenalidomide yeah. in, in lymphomas. In what, you know, what is the current thinking as far as how lenalidomide yeah. 
affects B cells. And, and yeah. does, what does it do to make rituximab work better? Great question. And uh, I have to believe there's a couple things. One is it has multiple mechanisms of action. It's very unique in being an IMID, an immunomodulatory drug. Not only does it have activity with respect to the microenvironment and downregulating certain chemokines or certain stimulants that, you know, feeding the cancer cells in the microenvironment, it downregulates these factors that are pro-growth factors. It also affects T cell immunity and it improves it, it activates T cell immunity. It also has anti-angiogenesis effects. Right. So, you know, starve a tumor, feed a tumor, starve it. And I think actually more interesting, we published years ago with respect to looking at why perhaps the combination of lidalidomide and rituxan worked, and we did it in an animal model, and we found that not only that, it upregulates natural killer cells, not only the number, but the activation state. And I have to mm -hmm. believe that some of the activity we're seeing, not only there's some direct anti-tumor activity, we're improving with antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So rituxan is working better because you have more, uh, an increased number of your soldiers in your army. Right. And with those NK cells, I think we're seeing actually uh, in addition to those other mechanisms, a better ADCC. Very good. Yeah. Very good. All right, that's great. We'll, choose, let's, yeah. we'll stop here with this, and then we're going to come back and talk about rituximab maintenance, which seems to still be a very controversial area. So yes. thanks for staying with us. We'll be back with you in just a minute.